In the last couple of days, numerous headlines and tweets have reported that the Federal Reserve is injecting nearly $1.5 trillion into the repo market, and then as much as a trillion a day after that. This has sparked a lot of memes and a lot of people who should be fairly educated having some downright abysmal takes. Now, while I may be extremely online, I also understand the inner machinations of corporate finance more than your average bear. So what the hell is a repo? I will illustrate this the best I can. I'll start with a bilateral repo as it is the easiest instrument to understand. Let's say Bank A has some short-term obligations that need to be met. Maybe it's meeting their reserve requirement, some back taxes due, or maybe a particularly large margin call. It also has a large pool of securities to post as collateral. Here's a small list of the types that are commonly available. These names aren't too important for our purposes, other than the distinction that the Federal Reserve will only take these, which are issued and backed by the federal government. Bank B has excess cash on hand and wants to lend it out to earn interest on it. So they decide to enter a repurchase agreement. Bank A will temporarily exchange some of the securities in its pool for cash from Bank B. This is just like a normal loan. There is an interest rate. But, say Bank A doesn't know when they'll be able to repurchase those securities. Then this is called an open repo, which can roll over multiple days. But say they know they're getting some cash from one of their investments tomorrow, and they'll be able to repurchase them. Then they can set a specific end date at a specific time. That's called a term repo. If the term expires without payment, then the investor keeps all the securities and liquidates them to cover their loss. Term repos can last as long as a few months or as short as simply overnight. But overnight repos are the most common type of repo conducted by the Federal Reserve. Most non-federal repos are open, but they still don't tend to last more than 48 hours. So I will go full speed here. Bank A has taxes due tomorrow and doesn't have the cash on hand. They ask Bank B to enter a repo with them, with the term expiring by the end of the day tomorrow. They'll post 10 million in housing bonds in exchange for 9 million in cash at an interest rate of 1%. Why 10 million securities for 9 million in cash? Well, Bank B assumes most of the risk here, as the longer they hold Bank A's securities, the more likely they are to fluctuate in value. So Bank B values Bank A's securities with a haircut. In other words, Bank A overposts collateral so that Bank B feels safer. Bank B will also have a list of all the securities posted as collateral and their details. The trade is conducted and the opening leg is closed. The following day, Bank A comes back and repurchases their 10 million in housing bonds for 9.09 .09 million. The trade is conducted and the closing leg is closed. It would be utterly pointless for the consumer to have access to something like this. That would be like you giving up a brand new Toyota Camry to the government in exchange for absolving your student loans. And if you can't come up with the money to repurchase your Toyota Camry by the time the repo's up, the government keeps it. Now this only scratches the surface. Bilateral repos aren't particularly uncommon, in fact they are the type that the Federal Reserve often conducts, but they are by no means the most common method of raising funds in this way, nor the only way the Federal Reserve interacts with the repo market. This would go into the tri-party and GCF system, and if we zoom out we can see a very broad ecosystem, and a critical one at that. And while it seems very complex, it can actually make trades like the one we went over much safer and simpler for everyone involved. Firstly, the tri-party repo. This is very similar to the bilateral repo in that it still has two main parties, however there is now a third party called a clearing bank. This bank holds everything in escrow, ensuring that both parties get what they're owed. This protects the dealer, Bank A in the previous example, and that they don't need to worry about the investor not returning the securities, or per se, the settlement failing. The investor, Bank B in the previous example, is obviously still protected by the haircut. Now clearing banks decided they could optimize this system in the late 90s. The GCF repo, or the General Collateralized Financing repo, is designed to be anonymous, fast, safe, and even cheaper for everyone. Remember that list of securities I showed you earlier? This is actually a list of what's called General Collateral, meaning for the sake of GCF trades, these are all completely interchangeable. As you can see, this can be a potential rat's nest of connections quick, but hopefully I'll be able to explain this ostensibly complex chart. Firstly, we have the cash lenders, called investors. Typically, they use repos as a way to invest excess cash. The typical cash lender will be a money market mutual fund, a corporate treasury account, or other forms of auto investing accounts. They can earn a quick bit of interest and have protection via over collateralization of their cash outlet. The cash borrower, called dealers, use repos to finance their positions or obtain leverage for trading. The Federal Reserve has conducted open market operations for a long time, primarily by entering repo agreements with primary dealers like large investment banks. This is done to adjust the level of bank reserves so that the Federal Reserve funds rate stays near the place that they target. In 2013, the Federal Reserve began conducting what are called overnight reverse repurchase operations. 
This provides eligible banks an opportunity to give the Federal Reserve part of their reserves in exchange for access to some of the securities on the Fed's portfolio. This is done for the purpose of eliminating some of the risk involved in holding these securities on the Federal Reserve's books, as well as decreasing the money supply. I'm no central banker, and there are probably numerous people who can poke holes in my explanation. But essentially, banks are required to keep a certain amount of cash, called reserves, on hand at the Fed, kind of like how your savings account might have a minimum balance. The Fed also has a large pool of securities, in which all of the risk in holding these securities falls on them. In a reverse repo operation, the Fed still keeps those securities on the books, however, the risk is shifted from them to the party that holds the securities as a part of the reverse repo. The Fed also operates as a securities lender, offering treasury and agency securities for standard repos. Usually in times of non-financial distress like today, the Fed conducts about 15 billion a day in transactions. However, the Federal Reserve does not take cash as collateral. They only take reserves or other treasuries. Now, securities lenders seek to lend out their securities in order to obtain extra revenue on them before they mature. These tend to be what are called custodian banks, which hold assets on behalf of clients and invest them. Securities borrowers, who tend to be hedge funds or broker dealers, use repos to get specific securities to cover short sales or quickly acquire specific securities to fill buy orders. Normally, the lending agents manage the process and communicate with securities dealers, which seek securities for their own operations and the operations of their clients. These borrowed securities are reused over and over again and may leave and re-enter the repo market as they're used to cover various positions across the market. So why is the government involved at all? Is this a corporate socialism? Well, according to the mission of the Federal Reserve, their goal is full employment and stable levels of inflation. In our modern credit-dependent economy, a sharp reduction in the willingness or ability of lenders to grant credit can set off contractions across the economy. This will reduce economic activity and employment. The Federal Reserve does not deal in stocks, nor does it give out free money. It helps mitigate the panic in the market by providing short-term liquidity so that these contractions are not as painful. If the Fed keeps the market functioning by purchasing assets or lowering interest rates, that benefits everybody even if it feels technocratic and unfair. A credit crunch would hurt everybody. Businesses are already seeing major revenue losses, and many will seek loans to help tide them over. Low interest rates in a liquid market will help those businesses raise money, the families that rely on them for work, and the communities they serve. The economy needs both monetary policy conducted by the Fed and the fiscal policy dictated by government spending. The trillion dollar repo facility did not create some kind of either or scenario, with hedge funds and financiers crowding out aids to student loan borrowers and gig workers. Everyone is merely a cog in the machine, and if one cog, no matter how big or small stops functioning, even the biggest cogs slow down to a halt. If that machine is the US economy, and the small cog is the repo market, even that small portion shutting down can spell disaster for everyone. Fuck you!